So the question today that we're going to be discussing is how much table saw do you actually really need in order to learn this craft and make stuff? I mean, can you get by with something like this job site saw? Or are you actually going to need a full tilt bells and whistles kind of uh, cabinet saw that belongs in an industrial shop? I mean, if you're just starting out, What's the differences between contractors, hybrids, cabinets, industrial, or job sites? What are the different features going to add to your benefit? What's going to allow you to do more or less? What's a waste of money? Or what just feels good? So today, welcome back to Worth the Effort Woodworking as we're going to be talking about table saws. Now before we get too far into this, I just want to clarify something. If you want a full tilt table saw and you can actually afford it, just go get it. There's no reason you need to justify that decision. If you've got that kind of discretionary income, it generally means that you've made some pretty smart decisions in your life. You deserve it. I mean, a full boat table saw is a lot less expensive than most Harley Davidson's or bass boats that I could think of. And to me, it makes a lot, a lot smarter decision than either one of those but a lot of us aren't kind of in that situation and there's a lot more of a cost benefit analysis that we have to make for major purchases such as this and that's kind of what this discussion is going to be about and i need to be honest with you i am not a fan of table saws not a fan of routers either in fact if i was just doing woodworking for my own pleasure like i was many many years ago i would not have a table saw Pretty much everything I do, from all the turning stuff to making small boxes, cabinets, chairs, minor pieces of furniture for myself, they're all one-off items that I take really precise care in designing it. I enjoy the hand tool joinery aspect. I hate the milling process. So in that kind of situation, to me, not only does a bandsaw make more financial sense, but in a small shop, it takes up less space. It's a lot it is a lot less money to keep up. Blades are cheaper. I can do curves, all that kind of stuff. The stuff that a table saw accomplishes are generally the stuff I enjoy doing with my hand tools. Uh, dados, rabbits, grooves, dovetails, uh, finger joints, date, uh, morris and tenons, all that kind of stuff. It's just enjoyable to me. And if this is just a hobby, that makes a lot more sense to me. But, you know, if the person who is teaching you is very table saw centric so you have a lot of access to really great knowledge or maybe you know what you want to build you're doing a lot of cabinets for your own personal house or you like shaker furniture or you like the modern stuff then all that joinery that I was doing with my hand tools that I just enjoy doing would be a lot more efficient with a table saw and you might be able to get more done on a limited weekend or weekend night time frame. So at that, in that case, you know, getting the right table saw makes a lot of sense. So to make that type of decision, you kind of just need to know what types of table saws are out. So that's, so that's a great starting point. This right here is my uh, table saw. It is a job site saw and I want to say I got it in 2010, 2011, right when I started up my woodworking school because I was having to batch out uh, material for the individual classes. Specifically, uh, I burned through sections of wood like this, very precise three by seven inches, because it allows me to do dovetails, more some tenon joinery, dado grooves, all that kind of stuff, with a fairly inexpensive piece of wood. But having consistency for the entire class was really important to me. And I just couldn't do that quickly with a bandsaw in the 10-15 minutes before class started. So I actually went out and bought this for that one purpose alone. So let's take a closer look at the category of a job site saw. Now I have a DeWalt and at the time it was best for my needs and from what the general research, I, uh, general opinion I know out there, the DeWalt and the Bosch are kind of neck and neck. Each one has different features and stuff like that. But I'm just using this as an example of a job site saw. So I might talk about some features and some of y'all will go out there, well, no, this one has that a little bit and stuff like that. Well, I'm talking generalizations today. So 
take everything with a grain of salt. You might find one specific job site saw that has everything that a cabinet saw has. I'm not talking about that one. That's the unicorn. We're talking generalizations here. Normally these job site saws are going to be made up of a lot of aluminum. Uh, the interior has some sheet steel, plastic, a steel frame, that kind of stuff. Because their whole goal with these is to make them somewhat lightweight and somewhat rugged because they're going to be tossed in the back of pickups. They're going to be rattling around, that kind of stuff. It's more the lightness and ruggedness that they are looking for as far as the design goals of this type of machine. As such, they generally will use a universal motor. Now, there are two types of motors you're going to find in the, uh, most of our power tools. That's a universal and induction motor. The universal motors are the ones you kind of associate with a lot of powered hand tools. Your circular saws, your jigsaws, and stuff like that. They're really loud. They turn at really, really high RPMs, but they're able to get to their peak torque fairly quickly. They don't need a huge ramp-up cycle up there. The downside is they're not standardized. Every single manufacturer, every single model is probably going to have a completely different universal motor. So you're not going to have, be able to swap them in and out. Where induction motors are somewhat standardized. So if for some reason your motor goes out, you can kind of look at the power requirements and the power output that it has and go out and buy a generic one off of a shelf, put whatever pulley you need on it and go from there. Not possible here. So when one of these goes bad, you're pretty much going to be replacing the machine. And these universal motors do go bad. I'm not going to say frequently, but it's not uncommon because they aren't very efficient. And I'm not really talking about power consumption. I'm put, talking they, they don't transfer a lot of the energy into the movement. A lot of that energy gets turned into heat. And these things will just cook themselves if they are used like an industrial machine where it's turned on in the morning and never turned off. And you do that for months on end. It's just going to burn these things up. Now they do have brushes, which is a wearing part in a lot of them that sometimes you will have to replace. I've replaced them once on this one already, but that's just kind of normal with these universal motors, unless you get a brushless motor, which then when they wear out, they're just gone. Now in ba very basic layman terms, these really are just a hand circular saw bolted to the underside of the table. I mean, you still got the same universal motor. It is not exactly in line with the center of the blade, so you have either a gear or a very tiny belt connecting them, but it's pretty much a direct drive because it's so close. Uh, there's not m going to be any slippage in there. And that circular saw is just bolted to the underside of the table. Now, these tables are pretty much across the board going to be aluminum. Some of the very old ones were stamped steel, but they're aluminum. And look at all the ridging they are doing in there to try to add some strength. It's not a solid block of aluminum. They're just engineering it for lightweight. Now, because of that, these things were never designed to last lifetimes. Generally, they get replaced at construction sites very often. Now, mine is 10 years old, and to give you the kind of use I've done on it, uh, I probably run maybe four or five blades through these and I buy those red Diablo ones from one of the big box stores and when they doles out I don't get it resharpened I just replace it there that, that, that kind of price range but that kind of tells you the amount of use I'm using and you can see that I'm already wearing through the aluminum top quite a bit I mean you can feel the little ridges in there it's not a completely flat surface Plus the fact that the way they lock the fences down, it's actually a squeezing it between two points. When you drop these levers down, it pinches these two things to lock it together. Which means that, did you notice it slightly moved? I'll do that again. Come up and you pinch down. Now that's kind of a common feature when you have fences that pinch between two sides. A lot of fences, they just lock down on one side uh, assuming that you're not going to be torquing out a whole bunch and that just kind of keeps it a lot more consistent but whenever you are kind of pinching it down from one direction or the other it might be you know a half a degree different every time you clamp it down and that flexion you see it rising moving stuff like that even though the entire fence will move on this gear on this particular model 
That's not unique. You can just move them by your hand on other models. When you lock it down, there might be a little bit of difference every time you move it as far as angle-wise. And that's just kind of the nature of this clamping from two directions on most woodworking machines. The other thing is the fences are generally some kind of extruded aluminum. So you can see there's some movement there. It kind of rotates left and right. That's just the nature of the beast. Now this is perfectly adequate if all you're doing is ripping down 4x8 sheets and stuff like that with when you are building up a house because you know a 128th gap or difference in one cut to the other isn't going to make that big a difference especially if you're just covering up with a uh, spackle uh, particle board or you know drywall that kind of stuff but if you're making a small box that kind of difference will show up in gaps and a small gap on a small box looks monstrous then you have the idea that everything is mounted to the table from the fence alignment to the uh, motors to all that kind of stuff. So if anything is out of adjustment, maybe the alignment of the blade with this right here, it's kind of difficult to get it perfectly aligned. Basically, it's kind of a hit and miss. You loosen everything up, you put it all, get close, you tighten it up, and you cross your fingers. But on top of all that, there's still going to be some movement here. That's just the nature of the beast. We're not talking about much, but if you're trying to get a consistent depth of cut in something like maybe a dado, well, that will mean that it will be deeper in the middle than the outside or vice versa, depending upon if you are having to press down really hard to flatten the board out or whatnot. Because it's mounted here, you add a, and this surface is not rock, rock, rock solid, you add a little bit of give every time you're using the product. Now let's talk adjustment. Yes, this one does have this gear mechanism that I find it a little bit easier to dial in a little bit, but that's kind of unique to this model or some models like that. But whenever you lock it down, notice it changes. And there's still going to be a little bit of slop in here because it is designed for the construction environment. But then you come over to things like your angles. And that is something that, you know, a table saw user, they will be changing that quite a bit. So this one right here is very similar to most of them out there where there is no gear. It's just kind of you are putting it where you want it to be and then you lock it down. And if it's a tenth of a degree or a little bit off, so be it. It's a construction site, no big deal. But once again, if you're trying to get the perfect 22 and a half degrees to make a nicely shaped uh, octagon box or getting that perfect 45 for your miter corners. Well, then you have to go over and grab another tool because this diagram isn't, well, even on cabinet saws, you never want to really trust that. So you'll use something like an angle fighter gauge. You'll zero it out on your bed and then you come over here. But remember us talking about that aluminum bed not ever being perfectly flat. So if you're measuring it here it might be a tenth or a little bit off different there and then you put it up here and then your adjustment you come back over and what's happening is you're loosening the lock knob and then you're kind of then looking at it, then checking it's kind of cross your fingers and hope you get accurate now i want you to think about returning to zero because of the design they have a little stop there it's on a cam and this is really really common out there so the idea is you kind of set it, lock it down, you get everything locked down, then you play with a screw to find adjust it so that you can return to that zero 90 degrees over and over and over because that's kind of the most important angle in most of that you're doing with the table saw. But because it's connected to a sheet steel, plastic, there's lots of movement, it gets knocked off quite easily. And I imagine a job size saw, they just totally ignore that. I just kind of hope that the zero on the indicator works is close enough. And the final thing I want to talk about this is just the sheer size. This distance is not very big and you kind of need a little bit more of an in feed on this side than you do the out feed. So if you're cutting something off, there's just not much to balance right here. So, so if you're doing long pieces, you definitely have to have some kind of out feed or in feed support. Otherwise, it's just going to become dangerous. Now on a job site, a lot of times that's just the back of somebody's pickup truck. You know, you just run stuff off in there. Me, personally, 
I have not built an outfeed table. I once used my X card table. I, I sized it perfectly so I could just bump that up there and that became an outfeed table. And you'll have commonly seen me use a fold out table where I put PVC pipe to raise it up to be the perfect size outfeed table because it's compa compactable and I can, uh, I not much storage to that one. And that's one of the reasons why I got this over just any other kind of table. So when I started the school, because I did not want to risk kids playing around with this one. So I could roll this away when I'm teaching the class and then just bring it out whenever I needed to cut materials. So size can be a positive and a negative. But as a pure woodworker, this isn't that much space. Which is why you see a lot of people that are, you know, furniture making as a hobby. When they buy these, they, they save so much money that they can spend an extra hundred or maybe two hundred dollars and buy a couple sheets of plywood and they make a nice outfit table where this is like in a corner. So they have assembly tables and stuff like that. And then in that situation, this smaller size uh, really becomes an asset because it can fit into that bigger table and the lightweight no longer becomes an issue because you bolt it down. But throughout history, I mean, the contractor saw versus these, uh, the job site saw has really been more what people have been getting for their home shops and stuff like that. So let's talk about contractor saws. A contractor saw is still designed for a tradesmen. Maybe it's a finished carpenter or a cabinet person or something like that. It's designed to be light enough that you can still take it out to the job site, but it's heavy enough and it's rigid enough and it's accurate enough to do some really fine work. And because it is going to be transported quite a bit, they didn't want it to be too expensive in case it had to be replaced or something like that. So they really tried to keep the cost down quite a bit on them. So what you're going to find is A, they are going to have an induction motor because it's going to last longer. It's, it's more of a lifetime investment. But they're going to generally mount that motor on the back side. So it could be removed separately so that the motor and the saw could be separated to make it easier to transport. And that's kind of a characteristic of a contractor side stall, style saw is the saw is on the back and it's got some kind of belt to the belt to the arbor to rotate the blade. The other main feature of that is you're going to have a lot more iron in the saw. The tabletops are generally going to be, or that working section right on either side of the blade is generally going to be iron. Now the extension wings to broaden, make it a lot bigger so more useful as a work surface, sometimes you will see them kind of uh, honeycombed out iron, or maybe it's just a steel plate. Really those are there just for support. If they are not perfectly flat, that's okay. It's that center section that you're really concerned with and on a contractor saw, they make sure to get that flat and set up. But like a job size saw, the blade itself is going to be attached to the underside of that iron piece. It's still going to be very rigid, but because it's not going to have all those iron arbors of a cabinet saw, it's going to be less expensive to produce, a little bit lighter, maybe not as accurate, but at this point, I think you, you're nitpicking too, a little bit too much. But getting that alignment set will mean going up underneath it and just doing everything. Where, it, it, in other words, it's a little bit harder to get it aligned perfectly if it gets knocked out. The case itself is generally going to be some kind of stamped steel, and it's going to have legs so that you know the dust collection is not going to be good, as good. Uh, at, it's going to be better than a job site saw, but not as good as a cabinet saw because the dust is going to fall down. It can go everywhere. There's just not much there. And the last key thing is generally horsepower. You're going to see the power between these being between one and two horsepower, one and a half, 1.75 is generally going to be there so that they can operate on uh, 110, 115 volt normal uh, power uh, outlet in the United States. So that's the build aspect of it. The other aspect is the adjustments. Generally, you're going to have gear mechanism. They're going to be holding themselves a lot better. You're going to have a lot more durable and sturdy fences, though Sometimes they rival those of the cabinet uh, saws. In fact, a lot of times they're interchangeable. But 
that's sometimes an accessory you buy on top of it. So what's nice is if you get a contractor saw, a lot of times they're upgradable, whereas a job site saw, not so much. Then you have the cabinet saws, the Mac Daddies, the Bill Bees Knees, the Cadillacs, the Rolls Royces, what all of us are thinking about when we think that we want a table saw. These things are monsters. I mean, they are uh, three horsepower, five horsepower, seven and a half, even up to 12 horsepower. They're going to be 220. Uh, the bigger ones are even going to be three phase. You got 10 inches to 12 inch blades and even up bigger. They are almost pure iron. The tabletops all the way across, uh, though some might have extension wings out of, uh, you know, MDF or stamp steel or something like that, but for the most part, they are going to be iron. The cabinets themselves are generally either really, really thick steel or iron. The trunnions that are holding up the, the motors and all that kind of stuff, well, they are actually attached to the cabinet. So the tabletop is independent so if you have to realign it you can just undo the tabletop to make adjustments you don't have to redo the motor and hope but that trunnion setup you know they stretch across the entire cabinet multiple bolts pure iron they balance the motor the motor is inside the cabinet so the sound level is quite a bit lower and all that mass just makes it incredibly smooth the adjustment mechanism, because the thing is so heavy, a lot of them have are gas charged so that they're completely or balanced, so that it's really smooth. But because it's moving so much math, you feel like you have control with them. There's a, a lot more accuracy to the adjustment, and you know that because it's so beefy, once you put it to an angle, it will stay at that angle all day long. There's no reason to go back and check it. The fences themselves are incredible incredibly rigid. You lock it in. Now, it might take a little adjustment to get it to perfect right off the get-go, but you can fine-tune it. If you like your fence to be slightly out from the blade, maybe a thousandth of an inch over there so that the, the back of the teeth don't kind of score the finish so you can get a uh, glue-ready cut, you can do that kind of stuff with a cabinet saw. You have that fine, minute amount of adjustment. You also pay for that one. A cabinet saw is not going to move. Once you get it loaded off on the fork or you build it up right there, it's staying where it's going to be. And the price for all that milling, machining, casting, all that kind of stuff, it can skyrocket. But this is one of those situations where price be damned, they're going to buy the absolute best because that thing is going to be in their workshop for two or three generations out, it's probably not going to be moving and it's probably going to be doing that same task a hundred years out. So the question becomes, do you really need that caliper if you're just in your garage making stuff or maybe you're even venturing into the pro stuff, but you're making a few chairs at a time. There is a fourth category of table saws that I'm gonna kind of gloss over. And it's kind of a new category. They're calling it hybrids. And what it is, is you're taking some of the features of cabinet saws and some of the features of contractor saws and mixing them into one. The problem is they aren't consistent with it. Some hybrid saws use a cabinet, but they'll use a motor from a contractor saw that's like a 1.75, so it's 110 volts. So you can use it with a normal plug. You don't need to get 220. Uh, but, you know, maybe the trunnions are mounted on the cabinet in the side using the smaller ones, or maybe the trunnions are mounted to the table like the contractor saw with a lower, lower horsepower, but maybe the motor is not hanging on the outside. It's located differently. So it's not consistent. So if you're looking at hybrids, understand it's a little bit of a free-for-all, so you need to really do your research of what features and what benefits you need to get out of that. Having said that, I've basically built up from the lowest level in terms of quality and refinement in a cabinet or furniture making shop, uh, the job side saw. That's what I've been using. Then you go up to the contractor saw. A little bit heavier, a little bit better componentry for control, and you go from a universal motor to an induction motor. 
from the contractor saw, you then go to the cabinet saw, where everything gets heavier, everything gets more accurate. That thing is not going to move everywhere, and you'll get the a quieter motor, generating more horsepower, sometimes with bigger blades, but it's a refinement level. That's a caliper where you can set it and forget it. Having said that, I can't justify anything more than this saw for the type of work I do before I was doing production work. I mean, yes, this thing might have some accuracy issues as far as cutting the perfect uh, 90 degrees if I'm cutting a hundred different pieces. And that came into account whenever I was making these French squares. I had to cut both sides of that dead perfect without getting any gap. And what I was finding when I was cutting these is I could set it up perfectly. I could make one cut this way, turn around, and make another cut that way, and I would get the perfect thicknessing for my blades, which were consistent throughout the entire production run. And then I would cut six or seven of them, and I would need to check it because something about it would get off because my fence was actually riding against this piece. So if it moved a tad bit, I would need to make an adjustment. And if you see a lot of my videos when I did that French square, you might see blue tape on this side, then you might see blue tape on the top side. That's because I was using the blue tape instead of making the adjustments because I knew they would not stay that way. So to repeat, I could reliably make a few cuts but if I was doing a production run, I couldn't depend upon those settings staying still. Okay? So if I'm only making one chair or I'm only kind of uh, doing four quarter lumber where I just need to thickness it and then I'm going to be taking it to the workbench. So this is a time saver for milling productions. I cannot justify stepping up to even the contractor saw. But the moment I started doing production work, my latest one, I did these French squares. And the idea of cutting these so that this would miter in consistently for a hundred of them, which means 200 because they were two legs, and each leg had two cuts, the accuracy, and then I would use something else to get out the middle. Well, you notice I had a lot of what I call, was calling seconds with these that I used to experiment on the CNC machine because some of them would have a gap. Some of these angles would be slightly off simply because the, from the best I could guess it, as I was pushing through the maple, because it was at an angle, the torque on the blade was moving over. So on some of them where the wood might not have been as hard as others, the blade would kind of drift one way or the other. So I was getting, it's just a half a degree off over four inches, but that made a gap. Now, if I was just doing one of these, this saw would have been perfect. I could have dimensioned everything, and then I would have cut the joints by hand, and not only it would have been quicker because I didn't have the setup and stuff like that. It was when I can, I'm getting to the point where I'm having to make repeated cuts for hours on end that this kind of caliper of machine begins to let you down. Now the drawbacks of this one, you know, I talked about not having enough space here. Well, yes, you can do the extension cables, but you could also just build another bench top. I mean, these sliding fences sit on here. Get it aligned. There you go. Now you have a bigger tabletop. The blade comes up. You're not always having to cut through it. Other people will say, but these things just don't have enough horsepower. Well. I can tell you that in my 10 years or so, you know, I've cut, you know, 12 quarter wide oak and stuff like that, and I've been able to accomplish it. I'm not telling you that the motor doesn't slow down. It does, but I've gotten through the war. And how do I do it? I make multiple passes, and I make sure I have a very sharp blade. Uh, in fact, I keep a spare new blade offhand for just big cuts. And then whenever I know I'm going to do something that's, you know, maybe... 10 quarter maple, which I do quite a bit for my turning stock. Well, I'll put the new blade on that. I'll make those cuts and then I'll take that blade off and put the old blade on until it's totally dull. And then that new blade comes, becomes my main blade and I can go buy another new blade. So 
if you're having to go really thick, just put a sharp blade on it and either make multiple cap, cap, multiple passes or adjust your feed rate. It can be done. This can accomplish it. And we consider that brand new, I think this was like a little over $300. Nowadays, they're right around under $400. And I just checked on Craigslist. These routinely are selling for about $250 used. It's hard to justify the four or five times price jump to go from a job site saw to a contractor saw when the benefits of the accuracy and maybe a little bit more power are not something I absolutely need to accomplish the task. And then you have your contractor saw, making the jump from a contractor saw, which is going to give you the repeatable accuracy depending upon how you option it out, which one you buy and stuff like that, and a little bit more power and the induction motor and the extra weight, so the extra stability, to justify going from the contractor saw to a full industrial cabinet saw, well, that's a big, big jump. And you're also jumping up in price. So if you're just working out of your shop, maybe getting that contractor saw so you a little bit more than the capacity you absolutely need, which is always a smart thing to do, is a smart setup instead of a bare bones rock bottom job site saw. It just it kind of depends upon the cost benefit analysis of your current situation. Then again, if you know you've already been woodworking for 20 years and you know you're going to be doing it for the rest of your life, stepping up to a full cabinet saw, the luxuries it offers, even though you will never approach its capacity, hey, that might be something of romantic benefit to you so there you go you know now know the main differences between a generic version of a job site contractor and cabinet saw and hybrids are a little bit different but because i i want to assume that a lot of y'all are kind of new to the craft if you're just learning this i do want to talk a little bit about safety if you're wanting the flesh detection option brand wise you've only got one choice and that is going to be saw stop but beyond that, there is a lot of safety aspects to the different calipers of classes. But one thing I want you to really focus on is the riving knife. Uh, a riving knife is actually going to come up and down with the blade. So it's always a, just a fraction of an inch off the blade. So the, it interferes with the uh, wood squeezing on the back of the blade and being tossed back at you as it catches on. A riving knife, in my mind, is a requirement for any table saw, which is a downside because some of the greatest table saws ever made were back, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s, uh, some of them all the way into the 80s, but they don't ha really have an option to add a riving knife because those weren't standardized back then. And some of those saws are a lot better quality build-wise than what we have today. So if you're going vintage, my opinion to you, and I really want to stress it, is if you can't get a riving knife you might want to walk away especially if you are a new woodworker because that will make a huge huge difference as well as any guard protection and stuff like that well i hope you enjoyed this video and you got something out of it i know it can be confusing to new woodworkers because of all the titling and stuff like that but if you did get something out of it please like favorite subscribe do all those social medias it, that kind of stuff really does help us out with the algorithm on YouTube so that more new woodworkers might see this product. And if you want to help me out, consider visiting my website, wortheffort.com, where not only do I have a lot of swag, such as t-shirts, hats, and stuff like that, I have some of my own woodworking. I do mass produce some tools to sell to y'all to help subsidize this effort in video making. And last but not least, I want you to remember that it is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe. Have fun.